Okay, here we are. Ditch Digger CEO with my buddy Steve Grubbs out in Iowa. Iowa. The, the, Iowa. The, Where the, else? The, the beautiful prairies of Iowa and and uh, what a what a what a great state Iowa is. Uh, I, I, uh, my, you know, relatives are my sister and brother there, and, and I, you know, I, I, I love the, the state. It's, uh, you know, good, good heartland, uh, good, uh, Midwestern values, all the things you look for in a, in, in a great state like Iowa. Um, I've got, uh, Nick Lodge here with me. Hello. Uh, Nick's, Nick's, uh, our, our alter, alternate paradigm from, you know, my old Happy school paradigm. Here. Happy to be here. And then we got my buddy, Steve Grubbs from Iowa. Steve, introduce yourself, baby. So I am a serial entrepreneur. I am a recovering politician. I formerly served in the Iowa House of Representatives as chairman of the Education Committee and ended up working on six presidential campaigns. But at the end of the day, it, uh, it's pretty clear to me that if we want to solve the world's problems, it'll be done through entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And um, that's exactly what, uh, what I'm working to do as we speak. Awesome. And you've always kind of been an entrepreneur, even when you're in politics, weren't you? You kind of crossed over, still were doing things, right? Sure. I, uh, I started my first business in second grade, Steve's Country Store. <laughs> and uh, it uh, provided some spending money. I exploited my sister's <laughs> labor, uh, <laughs> paid her a quarter a day to keep an eye on it when I was gone. So, uh, ah. yeah. But it, yes, I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, there was no point in my life when I was not doing entrepreneurial things. E even in politics, we uh, changed the way the campaigns were run at the state level, and, and that helped me be successful and others that I worked with. Okay, and, and let's uh, let, we're going to go back to your the early days, and we want to hear history of Steve and, and what you're made of. What where, where you uh, you know where you came up with your values and all the, you know, the, everything that, that makes you who you are today. Um, but let's start with just a, that, that, a little more of the summary. Today, here's who Steve is and uh, what you do today and who you are today, and then we want to go backwards. So if I, was sure. if I was introducing you or if somebody was introducing you, what would you want me to say about you? Yeah, so I am a husband, a father, a business owner. We've got uh, about 100 employees across four different companies. And uh, primarily, though, I think, if I define myself, it would be as an entrepreneur. I, um, you know, once a company gets to a certain size, I have less interest in running it. Uh, I have a great deal of interest in, in starting um, a new company, getting it off the ground, getting it established, finding good management and putting them in place. And, and that's, that's what I love to do. Um, currently, uh, we've got these legacy companies that, that do well and, and pay my bills and allow me to uh, to live the lifestyle I have, but then we have two startups. One is Victory XR, which is a K-12 curriculum company that creates curriculum and delivers it in virtual reality and augmented re reality. Then we also have Chalk Bites, and Chalk Bites is a corporate training company that uses uh, mobile training on the phone as well as virtual reality and augmented reality to, to deliver uh, training. So think in terms with, with Chalk Bites, um, think in terms of the United States Air Force. So we, and for that matter, think of United Airlines. We would never want a pilot to sit in that pilot seat until they've gone through extensive training in a sim simulator, right? Sure. But every single day, people hop, employees hop onto forklifts, fork trucks, and they drive around warehouses with minimal training and minimal instruction. And what we and, and because of that, there are, and this is this is shocking, but there are 99,000 injuries in the United States each year. 36,000 of those are serious injuries. And 80 people die every year in the United States from forklift accidents. Wow, who so, like that? So why wouldn't we have a simulator that trains people how to drive those without causing uh, without causing serious injuries? And the reason is because simulators in the past cost millions of dollars. The the military had them. Ford would have one locally. John Deere, they're big enough to have one. But if you're a smaller, medium sized company, you couldn't afford a simulator. Mm -hmm. Today, with the advancements that we have in virtual reality and the hardware, we can create simulators that are better than the simulators that, that 
people spent or companies spent a million dollars on. Sure. It's 15 to 20 years ago. And so, so if you think about that, we can train employees how to drive fork trucks, how to drive paving equipment, uh, how to use a fire extinguisher on a on a uh, workplace kitchen fire. All of these things can be done now through simulators. So, so that's the the first part of of what we're doing. And maybe I'm going on too long. No, no, hey, no, no. This is awesome. And 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 you, as as you know, we, I'm a tr- pretty transparent guy. I'm I'm an, I'm invested in in this business with you. I trust you, and I know you're you know you, you are a, a person I'd always invest in as a friend and a leader. And and you know, I'm excited to talk about it because in our industry, Steve, uh, you know, we are gonna we're gonna check this out. But here's here's my thought when you when I learned about this uh, a couple of years ago that you're really diving into this and all that. I said, man, could I you know hiring young people in our industry is not easy. People think that boy, paving, concrete, asphalt, all the stuff we do, roofing and doors and all things you are they're dirty jobs, man, and they're 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 tough, dirty jobs. Well. Nowadays, if you invest, if we invest in the right technology, they're not that dirty. They're not that tough. They're kind of cool. There's a lot of cool things that go on in our industry that make us different with, through technology that young people would love, but they just don't really understand the, the fun part of it, or maybe they don't understand that they might have a passion for it, right? So I see this as an opportunity for me to invest in this, to build the program so that we can go out, hire young people. They can play on this game, right, and, and gamify their learning experience when it comes to safety first in our industry, which is very important, much like the forklift industry. Many people die in our industry. So it's a, it's it's the safety aspect first, then it's productivity and, and you know quality control. And all these things I'm confident can be learned in a, in a gamified uh, 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 environment, right? Where, where a young person takes the stuff home, they learn from playing this game, and then they go in the, they go in the field and they're 80% of the way there. How, how beautiful is that when it takes normally, in many cases, a year to train somebody to do what we do really well in the field? So I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm really excited to also tell you about scenario training. So don't let me forget that. But uh-huh. before, I leave, before I leave the simulator, so in, in VR, we can do simulator training and scenario training. So the, the, the simulator we are building um, has eye tracking in it, which means that um, in the simulator, we will have certain warning signs. We're going to have people walking behind the equipment. Uh, we're going to have valuable pieces of property. And what we want to know is not only do they navigate it, not only do they drive through it well, not only do they pick up the pallet or, or whatever the case might be, but does their eye adequately look around, see the warning signs, mm. see the people, even in places that they might not expect them to be. So we will have a score when they're done that says, okay, you saw 92% of the objects that you need to be looking at. That's a fail. Hmm. You don't pass until you see 100% because you can't fail to see a person when you're driving a fork truck. Hmm. That's when people die. Hmm. So so this, this equipment not only allows you to kinesthetically manipulate your environment, but it actually measures what you look at while you are in the simulator. And this will change the world. What you and I, what, what Chalk Bites is working on is, is workplace training that will save lives, reduce accidents, reduce property damage, and therefore reduce the cost of business, which ultimately, as we know, in a free market, it's passed on to consumers. Absolutely. So you know, these, these are the things, when I was in the legislature, we spent a lot of time discussing and voting on more regulations on workplace safety. So that's great. We, we want to have, you know, safe workplaces. But at the end of the day, you can tell a business, okay, you're going to be fined a million dollars for this type of, a, of an accident in your workplace. But that doesn't provide them the tools to actually achieve that. Sure. What we're doing in Chalk Bites provides those tools. So that's that's what I'm extremely excited about. But the other piece, and, I, and, and no one knows this yet, but um, we are working on, we just reached an agreement to do scenario training for child abuse. So think yeah. about um, who comes out of, of a, school, a college, right? So you've got somebody... Uh, a young person, they're 18, they go in, they go to college, they come out with a social work degree at age 22, right? Mm-hmm. Now, 
in, in every state in the United States, uh, we obviously have child abuse issues. And so what all of those states do is they set up home visits. So you have this, this new person that's now working with the Department of Human mm-hmm. Services or Department of Child and Family Services, and they have to do a home visit. Well, what happens, it happens in our state, and, and if it happens here, it must happen everywhere. The, these, the, these employees, they miss signs. You know, the first time, maybe they've walked in a few times, maybe they've just gotten, uh, you know, they, they've done it so many times, they're not seeing things anymore. But they miss telltale signs of child abuse. Mm. And so what um, the Child Abuse Council reached out to us and said, we need to create scenario training. The state of Illinois has a center in, uh, I think it's in Champaign, um, but they have a center that people that can sign up and then go to and they've built this thing and they have actors there and, and it's expensive and you have to travel far distance and there's a backlog of people who want to participate in it. So it's difficult to get that training and it's just for the state of Illinois. What if we built that same type of facility hmm inside a virtual reality environment and everybody's in this environment together in a live uh, real action time so now we have actors so so let me let me let me ask you this steve to interrupt you uh what would that what would the equipment be would it be the headset would it be glasses would it be a, a room designed for this what tell me explain uh to us uh, what that looks like sure Let's say that in your community, you have a uh, child and family services office mm-hmm. and, and people who need to do this. So all they have to do is go to Best Buy, pick up a $400 virtual reality headset. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a lot of them you can buy. And then they uh, log into our platform from their office, as long as they have a Wi-Fi connection. Mm-hmm. And now they are in, they're standing outside the home. Wow. Inside that home, are live actors who are going to create a scenario. Mm -hmm. They don't have to leave their office. They can do this from anywhere in the United States. They walk in that door and now they have to do a home visit. Wow. How cool is that? Yeah. The home visit is going to change different scenarios and and they're going to be judged or graded or provide feedback on how they react to that. So this is something, Gary, that we can really make an impact for children and we can make an impact in workplaces. And so we're right at the cusp of something very, very big. And, and, and I'm just excited to watch it fold out in front of us. How cool is that, right? I mean, our, our goal in our, in our lives as we get a little older eventually turns into, hey, what are we, we going to do to make the world a better place? And how cool is it to be able to be part of uh, in leading a business that might change the world into, in, a, in a better way? And you can look back someday and say, look at what we did. How cool is that? Did we save one life or a thousand or a million? Whatever, it's a big, big uh, add and value to the world that we help create. So how awesome is that to be part of that? Now, Steve, what, what I think about when I think about that, I think of two things. You know, our foundation, Cheryl and I, um, Cheryl has been behind this stuff in a big way or, or the last 20 years. Cheryl, Cheryl and a group, of, a couple of women started CASA of McHenry County. So CASA, you know about the CASA? CASA is, is it's court appointed special advocates. And it's a it's a non it's nonprofit and it's all funded almost um, not all but mostly by private industry by by people like our foundation and others and then it's it's so inexpensive to run because the people that raise their hand to be part of CASA agree to be trained and how to how to be social workers they're 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 stay at home moms that now the kids are off they're retired people they're they're a 50 55 67 year old person that's not doing much and really wants to give back. And and they so it's Casa started uh, probably 15 years ago. Cheryl and these these this group of, of, of mostly women started this thing, and it's and it now serves uh, you know four or five hundred kids a year in McHenry County, wow. a market that the that that the, our, our our social services from the government was not serving very well. You know, not 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 a lot of fault to those individuals because they had one person would have 30, 40, 50 cases they have to work on a year at least, right? Now, now CASA, they only have one case, maybe two a year that these people will work on depending on their time, but they have to be trained and the training is intensive. And, and when they're all done, they have to go through background checks and everything else. And, and these are great people giving their time and, and they're not perfect, right? But they have to go through this training. What does it cost to train them? That's probably the biggest investment for the, the investors in this, right? So if you can, right. Take, you can take that 
and, and condense the amount of time and, and money and energy it takes and train them better, how awesome is that? Now, now, so I, I can I can uh, get you in front of more casa. Uh, every, you know, most counties in the in the country now. It started in California, but many many co counties in the country have a casa uh, uh, nonprofit. And and again, that one I'm proud to say Cheryl was a big part of starting it. She was on a board. She was a leader of that board, and 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 we were we were uh, had a lot of had a lot of fun helping to build that. But anyway, bottom line is that's one group. Another group I'll say is another friend of mine. Uh, his, his name is Yako Boyens. Yako Boyens is is training right now uh, the our our, our country's uh, FBI, CIA, and ICE on how to, how to identify traffickers or children or people being trafficked. So at a bus stop, a train station, uh, you know, this person is like the is like world renowned in in how he trains. So you can identify very fast within a minute. Right, in, in, with high odds that, they're, that this, this is a person or a kid that's been being trafficked or trafficking, right? Uh, questions to ask, profiling, all the things you got got to kind of do to get that figured out, right? Mm. But but Yako is a leader in the space. But I guarantee you, he doesn't do it the way you're talking about. He has to take groups of people, CIA, whatever, 20, 30 at a time, and he sets up training for them, right? Uh, but I bet it's slower and 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 more. Uh, uh, you know, more uh, cumbersome than what you're yeah. talking about. So I'd love to inter I'd love to talk about that as well because how cool would it be when if he could train better, faster to be able to identify mm -hmm. that and 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 be in the same the same position of strength and and efficiency in both of those. Yeah. Right. And Gary, you mentioned uh, better, right? And and that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about, Stephen, and ask you is this immersion and the t technology, you know, this a full immersion. Why is this medium so much more impactful? For learning and is there um, you know sources that you can point towards that that show that that's true sure here's the number 80 percent so two years ago a Miami Children's Hospital decided to improve their training as you know at a hospital sure you have doctors but you have a lot of people who are uh, paraprofessionals uh, but and even um, you know some people who come in who may not have a four-year degree who've not gone through a lot of training on how to do basic things like intubation, uh, drawing blood, et cetera. So, so how do you train those people to do it better and, and so that they retain that information? So the Miami Children's Hospital built uh, this uh, curriculum in VR to train five different things, in, including CPR, um, Heimlich maneuver, intubation, uh, drawing blood, and, and a couple of others. And so then they measured the retention of that information. So there was a control group, those who trained the normal way, and then there was those who trained in virtual. They measured the results one week later, and then they measured the results 12 months later. Hmm. Here's what they found. 80% of those trained in virtual reality retained the information 12 months later. 20% of those hmm. trained the traditional way retained the information one week what later. wow that's crazy wow <laughs> that's amazing what a and different a difference what, what we know is and and on my website i've got this this um graphic but they they took students in school and they did a eeg brain scan uh while they were learning so there's three different brain scans one is the base state before there's no learning just sitting there then uh, the second was as students sat in a class, the teachers in front of them in teaching, and it shows there's an uptick, a small uptick mm -hmm. in brain activity. Then the third brain scan was when they had a virtual reality headset on, learning in, in this completely immersed way with the whole world cut out, learning with audio and visual and, and kinesthetically and, and doing and all these things. And there was a dramatic uptick in the amount of brain activity inside virtual reality. And so what we, what we believe is the case is that when, when your brain is actively engaged, mm -hmm. you retain more information than when it's dramatically less engaged. Sure. It makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the efficacy that, that we talked about. Sure. That's, that's something else. So what's, your, what's, uh, what's a, a couple of success stories you've had so far and what are you working on, Steve, in, the, in this business? Yeah, so... Going back to our K-12 company, um, we, I, I, was, I was at my uh, 
old university, University of Iowa, Iowa, with some of my fraternity brothers. And one of them is a superintendent of schools in the Chicago area. And he said to me that, that what you really need is a frog and animal dissection virtual mm-hmm. reality. Cool. Because um, Illinois passed a law that says uh, students cannot be forced to dissect animals. Uh-huh. But schools mm-hmm. really provide a viable alternative. So we took that and I went home. And uh, 10 weeks later, we had frog dissection inside virtual reality with uh, a national finalist for teacher of the year. She did the, she, we turned her into a hologram and we put her inside the virtual reality. And so she taught, she teaches the students how to do this. Wow. So we end up um, submitting that for an award and HTC Vive, you may know HTC as a phone maker, but uh, they're the number one VR headset company in China, number two in the U.S. They have an annual award for the best virtual reality experiences. And so we submitted ours. Eight studios around the world were nominated, only one from the United States, and that was us. Um, and we ended up winning the best virtual reality exper- education experience in the world. Another company won best gaming experience, but we were education. So that was a big uh, feather in our cap. And uh, in addition, this could this could be this could be a campaign for you know saving frogs as well. And there you go. And actually, <laughs> we also have done cats. I hmm. didn't know they dissected cats in school. Hmm. Uh, and uh, pigs and uh, sharks. Aww. And now we're working on little starfish. So uh, the the other big win we've had is that um, Microsoft has only licensed content from one company in the world for their schools. VR content, and that's us. So wow. I, I feel very positive that at this point we are, if not the leading company in the world in the education space, we are on a very short list. So go, so um, men, mention that name again. Chalk Bites, right? So Chalk Bites is our corporate training company. Yep. Victory XR is our K twelve company. So ChalkBites.com. If somebody's curious about working uh, on on a project, uh, and Victory XR. Dot com if people are looking for curriculum for their schools. And, and Chalkbytes, the new company, is, is under Chalkbytes? Yeah, yeah the, um, the training, the corporate training for uh, the forklift training and paving and uh, child abuse, that's all under Chalkbytes.com. Yep. And, and it, talk about the cool model you have, because I love it, um, and, and you're basically investing with uh, you, you know, you're investing with your, your partner, the customer, right? If, if it's a, something that can be a uh, scale, right? Right. A, a learning uh, technology that can be scaled. Tell us how that works. Cause I was, I'm, I'm really yeah. excited about that as well. Yeah. So essentially if someone says uh, we think that we have a model that, that we could reduce training time or improve training time in virtual reality. Uh, what we will do is up to a certain, you know, until we run out of uh, shares in this program, we will allow them to invest in the company. We will build them a uh, virtual reality simulation, um, and then they not only own part of the company, but they get a residual commission every time that product sells. So, so if the company succeeds, they succeed in three ways. First of all, they have the use of the product, which improves their training in their company. Mm-hmm. Second of all, they get a royalty or a commission every time it sells anywhere in the world. And third, the more it sells, the better the valuation of the company. Absolutely. And so three three different ways that a company can succeed if they have the right uh, plan, if, if we believe that it works in our model. And what if a company does not invest in, 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 the, in the mothership, but they think they got a great idea that can be scaled? And, you know, is there some partnership there as well? Absolutely. If they don't want to invest in the company, they, they certainly um, can choose to talk with us and and we... If we think it's a good fit for our developers, we will take on their project, build the project for them, and then they can run with it. We do this with two uh, Fortune 500 companies currently, and um, they don't invest in our company, but uh, they do need uh, AR, VR training tools. Awesome. Okay, so here's the deal. I, I want to I, I, I come back to you in 10 or 15 episodes to, to find out where you're at and what's going on. I can share some experience where, where we're at as well, because we're partnering with you and and a couple of things. Safety is number one for us. So I think we're, I think my team and your team are working on safety. I think we're talking about project management, maybe and some other things. But 
I can't wait. I can't wait to to, to play this myself and and uh, see how I score with all this stuff. But uh, I want you to go back to uh, you, who you are too, because this is all about you know where the, the this crazy entrepreneur, my buddy Steve Grubbs, where his head's at, how it got there, right? What, who 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 uh, who was there for you as a kid, and 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 who who's there for you today, and where you you know how'd you get to where you got, and where you going in the future? So kind of give us that. Uh, let's say a 15, 15 minute elevator of, you know, maybe you know, 15, 20 minutes of who you are, where you came from and all that. And then, and then we're going to come back in a, in a few, some episodes. So I, I want to dig back into this as it, as it continues to progress. Yeah. You know, um, I was on a plane with the CEO of Gallup uh, three, four years ago, and he was doing a study at that point, whether entrepreneurs are made or whether they're born. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there, there was mixed data, but what was clear is that certain people um, are born, it doesn't mean you can't become an entrepreneur, but certain people are born in a certain way, their brain thinks in a certain way, and, um, and I, I'm one of those people. You know, I was uh, born with ADD. Fortunately, when I was in school, that wasn't a classification. They might have mm-hmm. put, taken me out of regular class and put me in special classes. Mm-hmm. But I, um, I got pretty good grades, but concentration was always a challenge for me because a teacher would say something, and all of a sudden I would get this idea, and like my mind would like yeah. head off somewhere. And, and now I am deeply engrossed figuring out how to make this idea go. And suddenly I'll come back 10, 15 minutes later and I'll realize I I didn't hear anything. (laughs) Um, That has, to this day, that is a challenge. It's something took my wife took a long time to understand, to figure out that, oh, it's not because I don't want to listen to you. It's because my mind just took off and and I'm trying to get back. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's more about more than just having an idea. It, it, you have to be able to execute on ideas. Mm-hmm. Every week, because I, I am a serial entrepreneur, uh, people reach out to me and say, oh, I've got this idea. Mm-hmm. I say, mm-hmm. great. And I say, you know, and I give them my impression of the idea, but I say, don't listen to me. You know, what do I know? I've, I've missed out on some opportunities because I, uh, I, I didn't realize things were, were great ideas. So, you know, explore it, do your research. But at the end of the day, you have to figure out how to execute on it. And, and here's always my advice. A couple things. First of all, try to place a small bet. And in other words, you know, a lot of people will say, okay, I'm going to mortgage my home. I'm going to uh, spend all the money I have in all my credit cards. What I want to say is if you can try a small bet. So when we started our e-commerce company, um, I had a consulting company that was paying the bills. So, you know, I was good there. I could keep that running, keep the money coming in. But we started a small e-commerce store that sold yard signs. Mm-hmm. And I threw that up. And um, I'm a Republican. And uh, this was in 1999, early days. And, and phone rings. And one of the people working in my office says, hey, there's a Democrat from Ohio on. He wants to buy bumper stickers from us. Do we sell to Democrats? <laughs> and I said, I thought about it for about three seconds. Then I said, ask him if his money is green. <laughs> if it is, sell him the bumper stickers. <laughs> so we, we created the world's first uh, online uh, campaign store, which then morphed into bigfunnycards.com, the world's largest greeting cards, hmm. um, and, and about 10 other stores. Uh, and, and, you know, what we're able to do on all of those is put a place, a small bet that didn't take us under. And if it worked, you know, then, then we would expand it. You can't always do that. Sometimes you got to go for it. But if you can place a small bet, do it. Second, the other mistake that people make is they think, oh, I don't have time to do this. Or I've got to quit my job to do it. I, the argument I make to people is that people have as much time that they don't realize they have as they do uh, in, in their standard job that they do, say 40 hours a week or something. So, but what I tell them is you have to harvest your downtime. People always look at me when I say, what do you mean harvest your downtime? You're say, from my, Iowa, that's a common term probably. <laughs> you like that harvest? Um, so, 
if you think about it, you drop your kids, you, you go to pick up your kids from soccer practice. Maybe you wait 10 minutes in the car for them to come running over to the car. If you can harvest that 10 minutes and use it to build your business, then whether you've got an established business or a new business, that 10 minutes makes a difference. You lay a brick in the wall. Mm -hmm. And then later that day, you're finished with dinner. Everybody's settling down to watch some TV. You pick up your laptop and you work for 45 minutes, let's say. Okay. Now you put three or four more bricks in the wall. Every time you put another brick in the wall, you lay a piece of that foundation. By the end of the day, you can have three, four additional hours than on the weekend. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be successful in business, it's not a 40 hour a week pursuit. Mm -hmm. It's it's a dedicated pursuit. And and you can you can take the same attitude towards a nonprofit that you start, toward um, an organization at your kid's school that you start. But harvesting your downtime is an important principle. Because once you lose that 10 minutes of downtime, you never, ever get it back. Sure, and, sure. and it doesn't mean that you steal time from your family, because that's part of the, the dedicated time. You give time to your work, you give time to your family. If, you're, if you have faith, you give time to your church and your, your, your religious faith. But after you've done all that, you still have a lot of downtime that you can capture. Sure. Yeah. And I, I, I mean... So you, you and I, you know, we met, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years ago in a, in a leadership uh, conference and, and uh, our, with our wife's couples deal out in California, I think it was, Palm Springs or something like that, right? Is that where it was at? I um, think it might have actually been in Cabo. But. Cabo, maybe it was, maybe it was okay. either way, whenever it was, uh, you know, remember, you know, we hit it off fast, You're, you know, Kelly and Cheryl and you and I hit it off really fast. And you know, we were about the same age, we had wives that were, that were, uh, amazing wives uh, that 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 not only uh, were were smart as heck, way smarter than us, but definitely they, they had different strengths than us that made us better. And and I, I remember because you know we 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 have the same disease, right? I have this I have this thing my, my ADD and my mind goes all different directions. Pretty easy. I tra- chase squirrels often, and it's tough to come back uh, from that from chasing that squirrel if I don't catch them. And and I'm I, I'm not thinking about the conversation in front of me sometimes. So either way, same thing. And and uh, when when I when I look at this, you know, what what have you done, or what, what has Kelly done to help you with this disease? And when it comes to keeping you straight, keeping you focused sometimes, and keeping you family focused and faith focused, and all the other things. Uh, can you explain? Can you share a little of that. Sure. Yeah. So um, her strengths are a. She was a corporate attorney before I tricked her into keeping the checkbook when I first started the company in 19, my first company in 1998. Um, and both the, the companies in 98, 99 grew pretty quickly. And so she left her law practice and she'd already, she had reduced her time because we were having children at that point. And being a corporate attorney is a real grind and it's very difficult if you want to be a mother and raise your children. Mm-hmm. So um, she left the that practice. And essentially we built the companies together. I, my role is vision, which people sometimes make fun of, you know, my job is to do this. (laughs) 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 Uh, Vision, um, product development, marketing, and sales. Mm -hmm. Those are the four things that I do. Uh, Kelly does operations, HR, um, uh, finance, and then all the other little things that crop up. Um, and and when I say she does, she oversees those people. You know, initially we start doing them ourselves. One of the great things that w- that worked out for our family and our business life, Gary, is that um, in two thousand and one, you know, I one thing we both did, no matter how busy we were, we both always coached. There was never a time that we were not coaching, never a single year wow. that we didn't coach. Um, so, you know, I've coached football and basketball and soccer and the debate team at, at the high school. Kelly coached baseball and softball and mock trial. So um, I took my flag football team down to my elementary school to, uh, to, to practice. And uh, my little, my, my oldest son was a, uh, in first grade at that point, I think. And there was a little sign in front of my elementary school that they had closed it and it was going up for auction. And sealed bids were due on my birthday, October 20th. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Hmm, 
<laughs> my vision thing. Wow, this would be a really good present to myself. <laughs> I'm going to buy myself a school. So I went home and I told Kelly what I wanted for my birthday. And so we submitted our bid. And the building was only 50 years old. Six acres at the intersection of an interstate and a state oh. highway. Prime oh. real estate. Um, 26,000 square feet, two playgrounds, two, two uh, baseball fields or kick soccer fields. Basketball court. Um, yeah, basketball court, gym. I know, I've, been, I've been wanting to get there for so long. I've been to your house, yeah. but I have not gotten to your office. I got to get there. But anyway, it's yeah. wonderful. So how cool is that? We, so what happened? Tell us. Yeah, so we bid $100,000 and uh, actually 101. And the school district came back and said, there are three bids, you're the high bid. But that's not enough money. Hmm. We're the high bid. They said, it's just not enough money. So you need to give us a higher bid. So I thought about it. A few days later, I submitted a bid for $106,000. They said, awesome. It's yours. <laughs> so, uh, wow. How cool you know. is that? And so that we, we've had our companies inside uh, my elementary school since then. And uh, we have offices in different places in the country now. But, um, yeah, it's, it's great to stumble out of my office, which is the teacher's lounge, and um, <laughs> to shoot some baskets. That's awesome. Nice. That's awesome. How fun is that? So tell, so tell us about your upbringing. You got, we got, uh, we're going to go another 10 minutes or so. Just tell us a quick about, quick about upbringing, mentorship, any of that along the way. And, uh, and, and, we'll, and we'll close after that because we're going we're gonna to bring you back again. Sure. So. Um, my father's a school teacher, mother, a nurse. Uh, my dad is probably the single most risk averse person I have ever <laughs> met in my life. Um, early in my life, I would tell him some crazy thing I was going to do. And he would say, why would you do that? <laughs> and I, I don't know, why not? <laughs> and, and it, it puzzled him for a while who I was, I think. Um, and you know, when I decided to run for the legislature at age 24, um, you know, he scratched his head, but he was my treasurer. He kept track of my checkbook for me. So I needed that because I'm not in, I'm not very good at that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother was was the creative. So my dad, linear mother, creative. She uh, after she retired, she wrote 10 books before she had a stroke. Wow. Uh, oh. And, and so, yeah, you, you can find her books on Amazon under Joyce Grubbs. They all are sort of mysteries, but they all deal at some level or another with uh, uh, child abuse or, or sexual abuse, uh, bringing that issue uh, so it's to just, light. So it's jo they're all under Joyce Grubbs? Yep, that's her author's name, and uh, there are 10 of them on Amazon if people want to wanna read them. Is she, still is she still alive? Still alive, that's right. How's oh, she doing? She doesn't. She, well, you know, she didn't write anymore. When she had her stroke, it made uh, it, it set her back because you know that affects uh, brain function. Yeah. And so, um, you know, now she's she's a grandmother, but she got her ten books out there, and, mm. and that's that was over about a three or four year period. So pretty impressive. When when you get a but, chance, if you if you ever want to go back and listen to uh, Roberto Trujillo's podcast, right? He's doing great things to improve stroke victims. Uh, cr you know, connecting those neurons again and all that. So. Uh, if you ever want to meet him, he, I'll get you in front. He's my good buddy today and I'm uh, uh, a friend and an investor in his his technology. But I'm telling you right now, he's doing amazing things for stroke mm. victims, just so you know. You said yeah, I, 10, I 10 books in two years, you said? Uh, about three to four wow. years, yeah. Three to four years. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to mischaracterize where she is now. She's come back strong. Mm. Um, but but she, she just didn't write again yeah. after that. Yeah. So. Mm. It, it's a, t it, you know, but she's a great grandmother and, and a great mother. So I grew up with a linear father, a creative mother, and, and I'm a little bit of, of a mix of those two. And, uh, but, you know, very, very middle class. Um, you know, my dad was the person who never really felt money was very important. And so I grew up, you know, asking, hey, can we do this? Can we do that? So I was, no, no. No. <laughs> and so, so I grew up finding value in money and making money. And so that was something that was important to me. At the same time, my mother was the do-gooder. You know, she uh, worked uh, for the homeless for many years. And so I always uh, 
kept that side on, you know, how can we make the world a better place? Yeah. But still make a little bit of money and have some fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. And I also growing up had a pastor who uh, was influential in that um, he talked a lot about dreaming big and that, uh, you know, to, to dream, to do great things. Mm-hmm. And that was very influential as well. You know, helped me understand that uh, we don't have to exist within the small neighborhood that we might exist in. That's fine if one wants to, but if we want to reach out and do big things that are national or international in scope, just do it. Yeah. And, and he, had, he would, he would in, you know, in with his faith sermons, he would have these motivational sermons. And, and because of that, you know, in, in little Davenport, you know, this church grew to like 5,000 people. Wow. It was a big, big deal. It was one of those early sort of mega churches. Right. But, uh, but his motivational uh, sermons impacted me as a youth. And uh, that was, that was important. Well, yeah, how cool is that, right? Why can't that be a little more often? I, I, you know, I hate to say in our church, uh, a Catholic, our Catholic churches, they, they don't seem to really go after any of that, right? When it comes to just just personal motivation beyond faith. I mean, faith is a motivational thing too, and a personal motivation, right? If you listen well, but but boy, why not, right? Talk, you know, talk talk these parishioners into you know what they can do beyond what they think they can do, right? Using their faith and and, and using that confidence. Because I mean, if if you can, if you're if you're a God loving person and you really want to do great things for the world, right? Because you're compassionate. Hopefully, if you believe in your faith, well, how cool is that then? If you have a pastor feeding that to you, or a priest feeding that to you as well, mm-hmm. um, to to create more motivational minds that'll serve in the future way better than otherwise. You know. Yeah, it seems like you yeah. Put, put that guy in VR. Yeah. 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 He uh, he uh, has done some amazing things. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's actually. Um, created a center for um, AIDS patients in Los Angeles after he left uh, wow. Iowa. So he's, he's done a lot of very big things in his life because that's how he, he views the world. What other, what other mentors do you, can you think about that, that uh, yeah. make you who you are, that you may, be, may not be quite who you are if, without them in your life? My first boss was a guy named Tom Talkey, and he was a congressman. I worked for him. Um, then he left Congress and he went to work for 9X. So you may not remember 9X, but there were, I think, 10 baby bells, Southwest, uh, Southwestern, uh, uh, there's one in Chicago, uh, we had ours. Ultimately, those baby bells all started like coming together sure. like, like the enemy of the Terminator. They mm-hmm. like, <laughs> and so every time two baby bells would merge, uh, he was a vice president. The vice presidents, there'd be two of them, and one would get fired, or take, take a leave, yeah. and one would survive. He kept surviving because he was very good. And he taught me so much about dealing with people and thinking, you know, even though he was in politics, he was a, a very great critical thinker. <laughs> and he dealt extremely well with people. Uh, he was a Republican who represented the Democrat district, but, but uh, you know, he was devout Catholic. The nuns loved him. Sometimes they struggled to vote for him, but they loved him. <laughs> and he taught, he taught me how to, uh, to really deal a lot with people. Ultimately, after several mergers, he ended up being the uh, vice president of um, government relations or public relations for Verizon. Huh. And when he finally yeah. retired from Verizon, was one of the top, uh, one of the top executives at uh, one of the world's largest companies. Mm-hmm. And so the lessons I learned from him uh, were extremely valuable, and I think about them often today when I'm when I'm dealing with uh, you know the human part of business. What's what's one that you would think uh, you'd call his one of his best lessons that that you got from him? Can you think? Can you think of one specific? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, you know, I was his driver when he was running for Congress, and um, you know this was the early days of when partisanship was really taking root in Congress. Um, and he would frequently vote against his party. Okay. And I, you know, you know, I'm reading the papers, you know, I'm a young, young guy. And, you know, I wanted to understand that. And, and he told me, he said, look, the higher you rise in the politics, you're going to, the more you're going to have to compromise yourself. And this is a reality at this point in my life, I'm not that high in politics. I don't have to compromise myself. And so, you know, I, I choose to do what I think is right. And, um, you know, I, I don't 
hold it against those who rise to the highest levels when they have to make some compromises because that's sort of the nature of the beast. But the longer you can stay true to yourself, um, the better off you'll feel about yourself. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, I, I certainly was in politics for a while. I certainly made some compromises at different times to get things done. But those words always ring out. And, and I've tried to, uh, to live by those words. Sometimes I've done it well. Sometimes I've done it poorly, but uh, I've tried to live by them. Well, it's nice. It's nice when you, in his position, your position, and mine, when you when you can you can be a part of what you want to be a part of. You don't you don't you don't have to compromise. I mean, I should you know we should compromise often when when we know there's there's a great reason to. But if it's pr- principle is pr- principally related, don't have to if you don't want to if you don't need the job, right? That's why I love I love politicians. I love entrepreneurs that. That that don't don't need the job, don't have to have the job, that, because they 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 have so much confidence and intelligence uh, or passion that they can go anywhere and get another job, right? There, there, right. No, no reason to compromise or, or or fear their job or losing their job by by compromising their principles, right? So that's I, I love politicians, business leaders, entrepreneurs that and 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 people in business that work with in my on my teams that they don't have to have this job. We we they're here because they love it and they're and they're not going to compromise their principles, right? So that's an awesome lesson. I love it. That's right. What do you think of that as a young guy, Nick? It sounds refreshing. I mean, uh, to, to deal with somebody who, you know, won't make compromises will definitely rub you the wrong way occasionally. But I think there's a level of trust that you establish through that, right? And, uh, and it's more sustainable, I think. Well, it's, it's Steve, we're going to – we're going to uh, – we're going to round this up right now. And uh, again, I, I'm going to make sure, Chris, that we get uh, Steve back after we we, we, we have some more uh, crazy uh, success stories and, and chalk bites and, and what we're doing there. Yeah, I want to uh, talk more just about VR in general, too. Yeah, um, yeah. so we got to get back into that because it's, it's such an emerging industry that's going to yeah. change the world. But, but think about change the world. Our goal is to have uh, people that we know or don't know on this show, Ditch Digger CEO, people that have built something from nothing often, more often than not. And, and, and people that are going to change the world and, and, and always are going to look to give back and be a part of, you know, good things that make this world a better place. And Steve, you're an awesome example of that, buddy. You and Kelly have done awesome stuff for your community that we didn't talk about. You're not a guy that's going to brag about these things, but awesome stuff in your community. Um, you're, you're in industries because you want, to, you want to do things to change the world. And man, think of the lives that you're going to be able to save. And hopefully I can be part of continuing on with helping in, 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 this, in this business with you any way I can to change the world and make a safer place. People die every day in my industry. You talk about forklifts, you know, we, we run these skid steers a lot. We have 50, 60 of these things in the field and they're, they're, uh, they look like harmless little machines, four wheel drive machines, but people die every day getting run over by these things, right? Or getting thrown out of them or whatever. And, and you know, you're, you're, this business, our, I'm gonna say ours, cause I'm, I got a couple bucks in this thing right now, man. Our business can change the world when it comes to my industry. So how, it's so much fun to be part of something that I can directly see in the old in the industries I'm in, right? So, so I can't wait uh, to to continue to be a part of your your life and and the future of this, as well as anything else you do in the future that I that I'd love to just always be a part of to know what's going on in your in your crazy mind, dude, your crazy entrepreneurial entrepreneurial mind. Uh, so I, I appreciate you. And we also look for top top one percenters, people in their industry are top one percent. You're definitely there in a couple of these industries. And 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 what does that mean? That means you constantly are thinking differently and 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 you know, striving to be the outlier, doing things that 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 other people aren't thinking about, and that's fun. That's fun, and our listeners uh, will thrive on that as well. So, so I, I tell you what, uh, thanks a lot for being here, buddy. Uh, we we really appreciate you. My pre- pleasure, and um, Gary, you're an inspiration to me, and I'm sure all of your listeners. So, thank you for your support, and I uh, look forward to tackling the world with you. Awesome, love you, buddy. Thanks for your time, and uh, we'll see you in the near future. And until next time, uh, on Ditch Digger CEO, see ya!